I'm Terry Boone, CATV8, and our guest in the second program uh, on discussion, discussion of place names, uh, Na Native American Abenaki place names in what we think of the Upper Valley and beyond, Vermont, New Hampshire, uh, Eastern New York, Southern Quebec, and John Moody is here from the Winter Center for Indigenous Traditions, and our guests are Elie Joubert and Jesse Bruchak. If you saw the last program, let's jump back for a minute, or if you didn't see it, maybe a bit of a refresher. This is what TV programs where they say previously on this program, and they show clips. But, but Jesse, you were talking about Greylock and Mount Greylock and a bit of a history, and that's Ely's family. Could you pick up perhaps on that and, and talking about Ely's mother being your first teacher of languages? Yeah, um, the name Wawanolat, um, as we were saying, is uh, come down in history to be Greylock, as one of the translations could be, and it was said that he did have, in fact, a gray patch or a white patch in his hair. Um, and when I came into the language, I was working actually for the Green Mountain Forest uh, through John and heard of Cecile offering classes right up in Swanton, Vermont through the tribal offices at the time. This was 1992. Mm -hmm. And I had been lucky enough to be exposed to the language much of my life through my father, but never had formal instruction and never had the opportunity to learn from a fluent speaker the way that Cecile, the way that Elie's mother was offering. So I took the opportunity and went up there, actually moved up and got an apartment up in Swanton and started doing first weekly classes. That quickly changed into following her back up to the reserve where Odenak is, uh, where Ely is from at Odenak, literally meaning at the village, Odenak, uh, in Quebec, and started studying the language as much as possible. I even uh, spent a lot of time at her house and, and uh, got to know Cecile very well. There was probably a good three years where I really tried to immerse myself with her. I was lucky enough to know her from the age of 88 to 98. Mm -hmm. uh, she lived to be 98 years old um, and worked her, you know, those, especially those last years, that last decade, did everything she could to really get another generation of people into speaking the language as she found herself suddenly um, a part of what seemed to maybe be the last generation of speakers. It was a wake-up call for her, and I think for a lot of people of my generation, the generation that Eli is a part of, um, surprisingly enough, not so many people were speaking, and Eli was unique in taking a great interest similar to the one that I have, which is why I was so happy when um, we lost his mother that Eli and I were able to then forge a, a really strong friendship and partnership and had kind of equal energy and passion for this preservation uh, project that we're involved in of the language. And, a lot of people in my generation and below, I think, are also interested and have uh, picked up uh, what is left, whatever ember, and blown some life into it and try and keep this a fire which has never been extinguished of a language. This is the language that was passed from Greylock through the family um, all the way down to Cecile, to Eli, to me. Um, and not only from her, I was lucky enough to learn from a dozen or so other speakers, all of whom other than Eli have passed, other than Margie Hoff, who we just saw up at our good friend's uh, uh, funeral when we were just up there recently. Mm -hmm. And it's just that that generation, uh, the generation before Eli's time, where the speakers were all, everyone was speaking still, that recently. Mm -hmm. um, we're losing them now. Mm -hmm. uh, but even then, if I get into my <laughs> I'm thinking of a time when you used to go up and ask questions to my mother, and I'd be at my house, and all of a sudden the phone would ring. She says, Eli, Eli, how do you say this? Mm -hmm. I'd have to give it to her so <laughs> <laughs> to give it to him. So it's pretty, yeah. it brought they were back memories. Yeah. yeah, they were always, and, and we, we, uh, we I spent a lot of time at the Eli even when I was working with his mother. And she used to say to me, oh, he's book learned. She, she always say, he's book learned. Luckily, we have the books, though, and I think at this point we have to go to the Awikigan, all the books like Kimzoe Awikigan, as I said in the first hour, published in 1830 um, by an Abenaki himself. Um, if you could hold that, yes, John, because you have several books here, and I know you three seem to know a lot. If you don't know those cover to cover, you know a lot about that, and I've looked briefly at some of these previously. Talk about that particular book, and we, you have a couple others here that we can talk this about. This book has a very local connection because uh, Peter Paul Azonkiline walked from the Adirondacks. And what's the title of the book? I'm sorry. It's uh, Kimzui Awikigan, and it, which means 
Um, Teaching yourself book or a study guide? Yeah, it's yeah. a primer in the Abenaki language for people who are learning English. It really was for the Abenaki people who were um, of the 18, early to middle 1800s who um, were basically, um, although I think 50 years before had spoke, spoken English and French quite fluently, at this point the community was much more isolated mm -hmm. up in Canada. Uh, and there, Peter Paul was, although he spoke French and English fluently, um, and also was raised speaking Abenaki. When he came to Dartmouth to study, and actually the old Morse Charity School, which was a secondary school, like mm -hmm. a grade school, high school combined to teach people, teach young people English and, and the ways of the Protestant ministry before they went on to Dartmouth College uh, formally. Um, he um, was very concerned that basically the isolation of the Abenaki uh, in Quebec uh, was essentially meaning that they were being essentially stolen from in every aspect of their life and their relationship with the Canadian government and the Quebec government. Uh, he served as an interpreter for, um, for the tribe for uh, a number of years in both English and French and, and a scribe essentially writing letters from the tribe on behalf of the tribe to the, uh, to the governments. And, and eventually uh, there were many, many other people who through the school he founded there at Odenac, um, managed to begin the process of sovereignty, essentially taking over their own affairs, which by the time of the early 20th century was, was <coughs> largely in place. Mm -hmm. But Peter Paul, um, when he came to Dartmouth and Morris Charity School, actually Newport um, Normal School was where he uh, spent a fair amount of time in Newport, New Hampshire. Um, he was like Ely, actually in a very similar way, a brilliant student of the language. He was not only a speaker of the language, but he understood mm -hmm. the roots of the language, and, uh, which is what uh, Ely and Jesse bring to this process. So he um, fashioned this book. Mm -hmm. he, he, once he learned how to uh, read and uh, at least write in English, and created this primer for teaching Abenaki kids how to navigate in the English language. Mm -hmm. And it was published, it was really done right here at Dartmouth in this area, Newport, uh, mm -hmm. and then it was published in the 1830s by essentially the Billy Graham crusade of the time, an evangelical Christian. In Protestant the image of a white man, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, the intention, the funding behind this was very much like the, um, there's an institute down in, in Texas that does the same thing now globally, and mm -hmm. particularly in, in uh, the Amazon and all over the place, evangelical Christian tradition that does all kinds of linguistic texts mm -hmm. so that the Christian missionaries can be the first folks into native communities to mm -hmm. begin the conversion process. I would say Peter Paul Zonke line was an Abenaki first mm -hmm. and last, and, and, uh, and, a, and a minister, and a Protestant minister at that, uh, ordained minister. Mm -hmm. Well, he taught, he taught us all the, uh, the prayers in Indian yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. and documented them. He also did uh, the Bible. The Gospel of Mark, yeah, yeah. the complete Gospel of Mark translated entirely mm -hmm. into Abenaki, which is uh, he did a his, wonderful resource now. They did his white plate, of, he played the organ at the Anglican Church, and uh, he's, he composed the songs for the church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What they call that, songs for the church. Yeah. Hymns. 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 Yeah. Hymns. Huh. You Hymns. have other books, John, and I know that you, there's some more recent than that. Yeah. The, 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 I have not seen this book. I don't think I've seen this book before. Well, this is the most recent version of place names in, in the United States, probably the most thorough attempt to document native place names in the United States, which largely in the northeastern area is based on the work of a man named John Huden from the 1960s who was a Vermonter and a Vermont Historical Society um, uh, worker, hard worker, who did interact with a few Abenaki people, including, I think, uh, Stephen Laurent and Ambrose Abomsenwin about some of the Abenaki place names in, in Vermont. Uh, but I would have to say that probably 80 or 90 percent of what he wrote down in 1962, which is now repeated in this book, mm -hmm. is either um, an adequate educational guess, which is totally wrong, or just 
plain totally wrong. Right. Um, like I said, the one word they, that my Yankee people seem to have gotten right was Winooski, and they didn't change too much uh, the Connecticut River, mm -hmm. but a lot of other place names. Um, when we were taking a break. A Scutney, it? Mount of Scutney locally yeah. is one of the great examples. Yeah. Mount of Scutney is always associated with, with uh, the White River. Mm -hmm. The Grange in Hartford was called the Cascadnac Grange, but it seems that the name of Mount of Scutney was and I'm going to butcher this, and hopefully Ely and Jesse will straighten me out, is um, Kaskadanek, uh, Kaskakadanek, which I'm translating as Wide Mountain. Now, I'm probably way off on that pronunciation, but Ely's looking down at his feet. So well, no, no. Adanak would no, be mountain. Not too bad. Yeah. Wide Mountain. Adanak would be at the mountain. At the mountain. Yeah. So I think that's, that's, I think, we think that's what's going on, and mm -hmm. that was coined, that term, in the, in the early 17, to mid-1760s. Mm -hmm. We even have an account at Dartmouth from somebody walking up on them, you know, a crew of Dartmouth students and, and uh, folks who were cutting trees mm -hmm. to make the Hanover Plain, uh, going up on the mountain and meeting some, some Abenaki people there. But, the, I mean, you can tell just from that name alone, a Scutney is unrecognizable. I mean, you yep. just wouldn't ever think that these two names were, were connected. Um, During a just, break between recording these programs, we were talking a little bit about Green Mountains, and, and, and you were talking about the Winooski River, and one of the Allens yes. uh, was, was taken in and came well, back by the name. But let, can we talk about Green Mountain and Vermont and the, sure. the, how that name came? Sure. Well, the, the notion of the founding, of the origin of, of Vermont, the name, is from the French Verde Montaigne, which means Green Mountain. And um, Andre Senecal has done an extraordinary, a UVM scholar has done an extraordinary um, job of figuring out that that probably came from the Bennington County area and the Allen families and the Green Mountain boys of the early to mid-1770s. That's where the name seems to have come from. Now, the first coin of the name Vermont wasn't Vermont. It was, in fact, the Green Mountain Boys were mentioned first before the term Vermont was widely known. Um, and this is by no means definitive, but my best guess about what happened is that there is a mountain in Bennington County, not in the Green Mountains, that's named Green Mountain, just set by itself, and that given that Ira Allen's, the Green Mountain, Ethan Allen's Green Mountain Boys were named Green Mountain Boys, not Green Mountains, plural. Right. And that I remember, of course, growing up. Chances are they were talking about that Green Mountain, and that's where they came from. That was their anchor point. Now, I never thought much about this until Jesse came to me probably 15 years ago and said, well, that's funny because um, Ely's mother told him that the, the Abenaki name for the Green Mountains of Vermont is Askas Adanak. Well, please. Askas Neck would be at the Green Mountain. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Neck. And I don't know what the antiquity of that is. That was the first time I ever heard that. But then a bunch of bells and whistles went off in my head, and I thought, oh, so really what we're talking about is the Abenaki name Vermont and no, no non-native Vermonter <laughs> knows it. Hmm. And it's like that exemplifies to me the hidden nature of the Abenaki legacy and heritage in, in, in the state and the importance of, of encouraging Jesse and Ely and all other Abenaki people to keep the language going because this is an important thing to know, I think. Mm -hmm. so. I, I think it's in, just listening to it, I think it's also important to recognize that there's a mountain called Whiteface Mountain in the Adirondacks, and Abenaki, it's Wombadenek, which mm -hmm. means the White Mountain. And in fact, the entire range of the Adirondacks and Abenaki is called Wombadenak. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So there is one mountain which we still call the White Mountain in the Adirondacks, uh, Whiteface, mm -hmm. um, which may also trace back. And the Adirondacks, w the naming of the Adirondacks is a wonderful story. Um, that says the uh, Abenaki of Swanton um, in around 1780 were doing hunting on the San Halonek, uh, Salonek, which is uh, sumac. Mm -hmm. That word sumac is from the Powhatan dialect of Eastern Algonquin. We would say uh, Salonek, 
And as I mentioned in the first hour, L and R interchangeable becomes Saranac. Hmm. So we have the Saranac River. Um, the Abenaki of Swanton uh, were mainly harvesting corn, but also Namaska. They were uh, fishermen, and then they would hunt into the Adirondack Mountains. And uh, on the Saranac River, they were on one side were the Maguac, or the at that point uh, known as the Iloqua, which means real adders or adder snakes, the Iroquois, Iloqua. <laughs> And on the other side were the uh, Swanton's Tali, uh, the Swan, uh, Tali Swanton, Vermont, uh, Ombanakiak, the uh, Beniki of Swanton. And they didn't want to fight or engage each other, so instead they just started to throw insults back and forth. <laughs> and Taolawi Niswak Bizuak, they say, just like two bobcats. <laughs> well, and if you ever hear them, they do that, they walk up to each other and yell in each other's faces, but they won't engage. Hmm. So they would say, in the language of the story, it's Niswak uh, uh, Bizuak, like two wild hmm. cats. Yeah, just throwing insults, but nobody wanted to fight. So eventually the Manhak Wonganak, which literally means starvation's food, and it's a name for the inner bark of a white pine tree, and there's lots of white pine um, there uh, in the Adirondacks around the, the Saranac River. They started, to, Abenaki started to eat that, that inner bark, Manhak Wonganak. They started eating it because they become hungry. And so the, the Iloqua started saying, you're a bunch of... Uh, in their language, uh, something like Radirondak, mm, which, which means Londaks, which means uh, porcupines, or literally bark eaters. Mm -hmm. And so when Abenaki from that point forward would travel into the Adirondack region, the Iroquois oh, would call them, they call them Adirondacks. The Adirondack mm. Indians were actually Abenaki from Vermont coming over. And um, we, they say that the Abenaki then we yelled back to them, well, we may be porcupines, clearly understanding their language as well, which I think is important to understand, although it's very different. Abeniki could speak Mohawk as well and mm -hmm. speak these other languages, and that the word Mohawk comes, again, we say from our language because we yell back, well, you're a bunch of, uh, Eli knows, Maguak, which means you're a bunch of cowards because mm -hmm. you don't want to come across and fight us. Mm -hmm. And so that term, um, that term, and that story is still told, and, mm. and even the Iroquois at Aquasasni, the Mar both stories. Eh? The Iroquois tell us exactly like we do, and we yeah. tell it exactly it's like we do. Yeah, that, that. But no coloring. Of, of, of depending course, on your became, audience. became Mohawk. Yes, yeah. so that's the origin of the name Mohawk, which is pretty typical of names of native peoples in the Americas. They often are the names that the people next door to them who don't like them, or at least, at least in this particular case, were banging heads. And, yeah. uh, the Abenaki are one of the few peoples who ended up with a name that was close to what they call themselves. Yeah. The naming of people is, is I think, something, the naming of rivers, the naming of places. A, a, a study of, of our language is something that we see in, in story a lot. A lot of the stories in Kim Zoe Wikigan, that book, are about, there's a great series of stories about why are you called bear? Why is your name Agawino? Why is your name Plawino? Um, mm -hmm. There's discussion of place names. This, this story I just told was recorded in Henry Lauren Masta's book in 1932. He talks about all these place names. Mm -hmm. um, and there are in the backs of uh, Joseph Laurence and Henry Lauren Masta's books yeah. entire um, sections, chapters devoted to their analysis of stories place names. Stories of it, too. Yeah. Stories of it. Full stories of of uh, folk etymologies, as we call them, mm -hmm. of, of words and places. These two books? Yeah. Yeah. No. Okay. So, so talk for a minute about those books. I have two questions occurred to me. We talk about those books for a minute, please. Well, Jesse, do you want to? Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, the, f the first is, uh, is Joseph Laurent's uh, new familiar of Anarchies and English Dialogues, and it's one of these ones that goes on and on the title. The first published on the grammatical system and Joseph Laurent was a chief of the Abenaki. He had this, a similar motive um, to Peter Paul Zokalain in that he felt the way that the Abenaki could establish an economy was through basket trade. Mm -hmm. And so he set up uh, in what he felt was the home of his people, the Sokwaki in Intervale, New Hampshire, a small village that still the remnants survive to this day. And in order for people to better facilitate their selling of baskets, this book was to teach them how to speak English. Mm -hmm. And so it's pretty much entirely a Beneke first. You know, mm -hmm. it's wonderful to, and we can learn from it. Um, and a, as I said at the back, there's this whole section on all just place names, Alasaguntuk, as we mentioned. And in those books, and I have not seen that book before, in those books, 
was there any attempt to give the, the, the Beneke, as you say, reading that, a, a pronunciation? Uh, no. No, because it was written for <laughs> Beneke speakers, and the same is true again here. But, but, but Beneke speakers could look at that, and how do you, to say a word in a Beneke mm -hmm. and say it in English, how do you know? Oh, that? okay. In that yeah. time, they were learning a French language. Okay. So, so they had a basis for pronunciation, and they knew their pronunciation. Yes. So now, just turn to the English, okay, the English, and... In the front of, I don't know, usually they have a... Uh, yeah, he did. The, neither one of them give a breakdown of how to pronounce English, which is, which is actually fascinating. The, the other book that is, uh, is here is the last one, um, another chief and a schoolmaster, Henry Lauren Masta, created uh, a Beneke Indian Legends, Grammar, and Place Names. So we get place names right in the title, mm -hmm. and this one ends with place names. And this one has the story of the Abenaki at Swanton, Vermont, that I just told about Sar the Saranac River meeting mm -hmm. with the Mohawks, and a lot of other stories uh, in the language. And it's just, it's this a beautiful resource to read, and you can see how the language, the orthography that's been established is is pretty similar to the way we write, mm -hmm. uh, with the exception of a number being used. And the word Nik Wombi means now, and uh, it has an eight in it for the on sound. And that on sound, a lot of words we speak in English, I think there are 150 or more words that come directly from Eastern Algonquin a language, if not from a Beneke itself, for example, skunk. And when we say skunk, we're using the nasal perfectly. That would be spelled S-K-8-K, skunk. But then there's another sound at the end we don't have in English, a W, so we'd say it skunk, skunk. And that uh, aspir unaspirated W, skunk, happens. And uh, literally, skunk is to spray, hmm. is what that word means. And it's a loan word that we have now in the English language, along with moose, which means strange, and caribou, which means shoveler, um, squirrel, chickadee. Chickadee is onomatopoeia for, it literally, it's a gidzigigi hlasis, which means he's the gidzigigi bird. And if you listen to a chickadee dee dee, it's a gee gee gee. It's hmm. their it's their song. Hmm. Hmm. Many other things other than just uh, than just uh, um, place names have been loaned. Uh, I heard a, a radio program uh, sometime in the past couple of years, and I, I can't remember who the the panelists were, who the host was, but there was some reference to the typical American having a vocabulary of approximately sixty thousand words but only regularly using 4,000 of those words. And I'm thinking, listening to you describe this, any, any idea of how many different words might be in the Abenaki mm -hmm. language? Uh, yeah, an, Eastern, an Algonquin language by definition is an inexhaustible number of words. No, we can make words. Because you can just always make new words and they're probably in any conversation are going to be words that have been come to have come together in a way that may have never been may never come together before because it's uh, polysynthetic so you can have an entire sentence in one word usually at most two words to express everything you need to say for example sunk higuruigwahlunk is one word it has that at the end sunk higuruigwahlunk and what it means is he came rolling down the hill hmm. and it's it's one word hmm. and it's my construction of it and of course there's other ways that that could come together and express the same thing mm -hmm. so a dictionary is is always going to be uh, large and Eli and I work on dictionaries the most important thing both of us realize is that rec knowing the roots the 500 or so roots you say mm -hmm. 4,000 words if you know 500 roots and then have some sense of how to put them together mm -hmm. um, that's how the the words are going to. But be you more. have to go. You have to. You know. You just don't find a word that sounds the, the, that you really want to say. You check other words that might mean the same thing, and check more if there's another word that means the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then you got the choice of which one you really think fits into yeah. what you mm -hmm. want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like in English. Like he said, rolling down the hill. I would say tumbling down the hill. Mm -hmm. See, so you have to. Pick out these words. And, and is that strictly a generational thing? Why would you say tumbling when he would say rolling? Why? What? It's just, a, I mean, you have to look Your at manner the manner of speaking. Yeah. You know, it's, I say tumbling, he says rolling. Mm -hmm. 
Now, to me, forget his rolling because tumbling is what you would do. Yes. You don't roll, right. you tumble. But a you ball got, rolls, yes, right. a man tumbles. Huh. Mm -hmm. Healy is exquisitely specific and articulate. Mm -hmm. If you wanted levels, an estimate from me, and I don't know much about this, I would have to say just the dictionary that a fellow named Gordon Day published but, on the Abenaki language has mm -hmm. at least... Gordon Day. Yes, mm -hmm. it has about um, 25 thousand words. And what's the, what's the title of the dictionary? It's the Western Abenaki Dictionary. There's okay. an English to Abenaki and Abenaki to English okay. version. Healy, sorry, we interrupted. But, but yeah. I'm, not, I'm not saying he's wrong. No. He's, he's, he's right he, because he's saying what he thinks it is. You would say it slightly differently and right. you right. have that and one you word notice difference. I would never have corrected him because I know what he's talking about. Yes. That's the important thing. Do I know what he's talking about? And I do. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing Let's to be said. We have probably... So let me just inter Go ahead. interrupt you one minute, Terry. And the thing that's remarkable of what, what's happening here today and this weekend with the Abenaki Language Gathering and, and with the work that Ely and Jesse and others are doing here, not only here, but also in Penobscot and, and in uh, the rest of uh, Wabanaki country to the east, is that... Um, the little book, the yellow book I showed you uh, mm -hmm. from Peter Palazonki line, there are, I don't know how many more words that Jesse yeah. has, has been able to find in the translated oh, materials wow. that Peter Palazonki line did with hymns and the Gospel of St. Mark. Mm -hmm. There are a vast number of more words. Mm -hmm. And everywhere we look, we're finding those kinds of uh, sources. So with Ely... <laughs> Ely's brilliant approach to things, that very detailed conversation you just witnessed, which is I've heard a few uh, versions of and, and Jesse and Ely are working on constantly, there is a very careful, and you would say it's a linguist, if you were in anthropology, it's a linguist's approach to things, very, mm -hmm. very precise. Or an English major, if mm -hmm. you were Garrison Keeler, an English major's approach to mm -hmm. precision in language. And, and Ely and Jesse are both extraordinarily precise when it comes to language. And, uh, and the language, despite its being flexible, is by no means, well, I, and I think a fellow wrote in the, in the 30s, there are, there's no such thing as a primitive language anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And that's particularly true of the Algonquin languages. They are extraordinarily ancient and extraordinarily uh, packed with information and ways of communicating which contain subtleties, which I think in some parts of the English language can be can still be found, but are mostly not geographically based. Mm -hmm. They don't have a connection to the plants, the animals, the trees, the, the geography. And in that respect, I think place names become essential for understanding the antiquity of things. Greylock was clearly, the mountain was clearly named by Yankee people in honor of Greylock. Mm -hmm. Kaskak Adanek is a wide mountain. Mm -hmm. Mount Escutney is a wide mountain. And that could well be the name that that mountain has had for the last 10,000 years or the last whatever. I mean, back to, as my Abenaki creationist wife likes to say, back to the beginning. And um, that's important to know in, uh, in a non-native sense. So, Jesse, let, let, let's, uh, f I know uh, when we did a program like this a couple of years ago and, and uh, at the same time, you, you, I think you had a flute and, and played some music, but we talked about, and you brought it up again today, about the beginning of your learning the language. I didn't hear the story about going to Swanton and so mm -hmm. on, but from Ely's mother. That was, an, that was tw almost 25 years ago? Or? Yeah. About that. Mm -hmm. yeah. How do you feel about it these days? Are you encouraged with what's going on? I, and <laughs> we're going to talk about your family. Uh, you seem to, uh, listening to you, having been around you a couple of times, my sense is you absorbed a lot and you have a passion for it. Mm -hmm. uh, are you optimistic that uh, Ely wants to jump in here, I can tell. I <laughs> Go ahead. Don't, don't get mad at me. He is, I got to say it this way. I keep him so damn busy in this language yes. that he's got it. He's getting it, and he loves it, and he wants more and more right. and more. Good. And so I think it's, and I couldn't have picked a better person either. That's. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so you, the, I infer from that mm -hmm. that you're relatively 
pleased with how he's done in that 20, almost 25 years. Uh, are there others like Jesse that have the passion, that have the interest, the self-discipline, the, the gift, if you will, to not only hear a word, but then go to the other words? We went to a, vi we went to a visit in Odenak, and those people did not speak Indian. They heard us speak, and they wanted to, but what sister, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. What they're hearing is something that's generating from us. Mm -hmm. So it isn't, and uh, how do we get our students the same way? It's, this guy is so smart when it comes to teaching. He doesn't teach like you go to college and this and that. He'll show a picture. What do you see in the picture? Mm -hmm. Say an Indian. Mm -hmm. Now let's make a sentence out of what you saw. Puts it all together. Yeah. That's right. so and wonderful. The, the songs, yeah, the anyway. teaching songs. Yeah. But, but I guess the question I'm trying to get to is, is when you learned about having a chance to go to Ely's mother mm -hmm. and back in the early 90s and you rented that apartment and you decided, to, you were, I think you said first you were doing it weekly yeah. and then the place <laughs> picked up. Did you have any idea then of how immersed you were I mean was, was that your determinant you wanted to get you wanted yeah, to absorb yeah. as much as you could I wanted to be fluent and I think I wanted to listen and observe it and remember as much as I could and share it and I think the great thing as we started with is that that's come to full fruition with my relationship with Eli now um, what we're doing this weekend we have some wonderful students who are very inspirational to me to see we have people who have probably the ability to go beyond, and that's the goal, is that they can go beyond where we've gone. Mm -hmm. um, the internet's a huge part of what we do. WesternAbeneke.com um, is a website that we maintain, and we have a radio show on there and a searchable and keyword searchable engine, you know, and all this so you can find the words you want. I have a YouTube channel. Um, we have a great Facebook presence. We have over 500 members on Facebook in our own private group. Mm -hmm. And there's some good students who we don't even know who mm -hmm. are learning the language from Eli. Eli's on there all the time helping people. Um, we have a great friend, Connor Quinn, um, who is an amazing linguist who's on our, our Facebook page and comes to our language gatherings and helps out. And mm -hmm. um, I think it's a really good time, but it's a really, uh, it's a del the, the language is in a very delicate place where it could certainly have been lost. It's on the brink still, but it's positioned to make a comeback. Mm -hmm. If if all of, you know, this, you know, it's not just my dream though, I'm just, you know, it's not my language. It's something that I love and I hope that others will embrace and it will become something that others can, um, as Elise said, hear us doing and be inspired by mm -hmm. and say, hey, I can do that. I think one of the biggest problems with Native communities is that we see our languages perishing and we don't we feel helpless and we don't know what we can do to bring them back mm -hmm. and I think to see an example if anything else if I can be an example of if you stick with it that's all it takes it may be one word a day it may be one word a month whatever you can do don't give up and eventually it grows and it becomes in something bigger than maybe you are and that's that's a beautiful thing and uh, there's another, another thing too that's important yeah. to us it is because other tribes yeah. that have languages and didn't lose their language, they love us. I mean, we go visit them and, mm -hmm. hey, yeah, hey, hey, whoa, it's a party time. This is great. <laughs> yeah. How do you say this? How do you say that? Whoa, 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 hey, you know, it's fun. It is You've got to make fun with it. I'm yeah. not sure if he originated it or, or got it from someone else, but that uh, famous Mohawk philosopher, Woody Allen, came mm. up with the line, 90% of life is just showing up, so you're, stay with it. Exactly. Just, just, just keep Stick at to it. it. You were joking, of key. course, Terry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> was it too subtle for you, John? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, that was pretty subtle. I kind of missed but it. But that's, that's the key, keep showing up, <laughs> keep working at it, and finding new ways and fun ways. Um, in my own personal life, And I, new words. Yeah, and new words all the mm. time. Just learn as much vocabulary as you can. Don't don't, don't get frustrated. I, the nice thing is there's lots of different ways to learn a language. There's lots of different things. We sing, we play, we dance. Um, we, we look at lessons. We break it down. We, we get into the nitty gritty of the grammar. Well, you're and also raising your two children, was, yeah. Jesse. Oh, I was going to ask you, it's probably an appropriate time. How do you, can you say Batman and, and Abenaki? As, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> Madagini Hlas is a bat. Madagini Hlas, literally Madagin is skin. Mm -hmm. And Ihlas means flyer or goer or bird. Mm -hmm. So Madagini Hlas is a skin 
uh, bird and bat uh, man would be sanomba. So madagini khlas sanomba would be batman. Could and we invite sanomba to appearing on cue? Please come in. Oh, and, uh, and let's talk about this young man in his batman shirt. <laughs> Jacob, thank you for being so patient and joining us. Could you introduce Jacob and uh, maybe? talk about what you're doing with your family in the language. Yeah, I've been uh, lucky enough to have two kids now. My namun tama nia indos, indawon si samak, my children ta nia ibitak luzi on nombai we spiwi agmo alomi we we won mak. Kongiska ki namun nia kluzi on nombai we spiwi kia. Uh-huh. Kia ki we gon damen. Uh-huh. Kakari tsatsapana on flo kongan spiwi nia ibitata kasiwi. Nda, okay, so we uh, I speak every day in the language to them, and I don't push them or force them, and I ask you know, um, them. But I make it contextual, and I think the beautiful thing about a family environment, laka miguzo, as we said, is kind of the word for tribe. It means family. Um, a laka miguzo is about, laka miguzo means treating someone in a good way or politely. And I, the language is just there contextually, and it's natural. And in that natural way, if I say, akwi mamonzi, it's like stand at attention, you know, don't move. It makes sense right now. Um, if, we're, <laughs> if we're outside and we're playing and I say, oh, kina, ula gisagat pam gisga. Mm, nice day. Yeah, it's a beautiful day. <laughs> Everything just flows the way that it naturally should. And having my kids uh, with me and being able to speak to them every day has made me more fluent. And, you know, I feel like in a lot of ways they've become more fluent than I am because they don't question, they don't know the roots, they don't know the grammar, they just know the context. Mm -hmm. Um, and they understand I throw new words in there all the time and they don't usually ask me kagwi inamuo. They usually ibita um, uwal tamenal. They usually just understand. And that's wonderful to see happening and I'm inspired that they, you know, they, they're interested in at this point in their lives continuing to be speakers and helping the language. I know kiakidik sidawi udzi yo adalakiri mek pamlong pamgiskak saba. Saskia, so we, he's excited. Hmm. He I, doesn't have like the, the four of us have these little lavalier yeah. microphones on, and you don't have one. But but if you stand close to your father, uh, could you tell us your name, please? Jacob. And how old are you? Seven. Thank you for being here today, and thank yeah. you for being we'll so be patient. Kia kikizi ida ni almambaiwe and de Luizi Jesse Talawini. So we ola loka tani ayan. Where's it? Salatogi. Salatogi. Saratoga. Ola loka uliuni namon. Katsili ni seko. Uliuni. Thank you for joining us. We have only a few minutes left. Thank you for coming on with us. You can. Yeah. You're welcome to stay and listen to a couple of the questions we have and uh, the, before we finish up the program. I, I think we did two years ago, but could we do it again today, please? What's the distinction between the pronunciation of Abenaki mm -hmm. and Abenaki? And you were told, we were talking earlier about tribes and, and, and outside, mostly Canada, I think, was what I remember from an earlier program. Why the difference in the pronunciation of it, Abenaki it's and Abenaki? It's very, very simple to remember and actually helps you to become a speaker. Um, the, the, the emphasis has Third to be on a certain, s certain syllable. The third syllable from the end in any word that has more than three syllables has the emphasis or the stress. In English, we often stress the end, so we say abenaki. Now, if I go back three, we have aben aki. So this emphasis is on ben aki, three from the end. So aben aki, and we heard that with liwitamen uh, as opposed to liwitamen. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of if you were a speaker of the language, you would say, Nia inclusi abenaki. It's right, it follows the pattern rather than mm -hmm. saying, Nia inclusi abenaki. Mm -hmm. you know, it just, that's English, that's mm -hmm. an English accent. <coughs> and it's fine to say it that way. Many Abenaki people say and naturally call themselves Abenaki because that's how okay. other people come to know us. I think some even say mm -hmm. ab ab Abenaki. Uh, oh yeah, they dropped the e right out of yeah. it. Abenaki budgies, yeah. you know, up in Maine and here. You're not wrong. I've heard that way. more. Right, it just there. It just doesn't the, follow fact, the intonation of the language itself. And there's the lang the Camp Abenaki, yes. uh, YMCA camp up in Grand Isle. They still use the A B N A K I, which is the sort of conventional Yankee version of it huh. from the 19th century, which huh. is of course 
drop every foul yeah. out you can. Mm -hmm. uh, I, what I like about my language is that it sounds like a song. If you just sit back mm -hmm. and someone that knows how to talk, mm -hmm. oh, it's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. it, it's, oh, it mm -hmm. goes right through me. Before we finish, and I, I'm going to ask if we could close with a song sure. in a second, Sorry. but but John, is there anything uh, that, that that we want to touch on that we haven't? And um, we will do other programs later, not r immediately, but uh, sure. uh, anything that we want to slip in today in, in, in our discussion? Well, I'm just very grateful to Jesse and Ely. I'm also grateful to Jesse Bowman, who mm -hmm. that's uh, Jesse's <laughs> middle name. It's also his grandfather's name, mm -hmm. Jacob's great-grandfather. And um, actually, it's Jesse's great grandfather's name, and it's Jacob's great great, -great, -great grandfather's name. And to Cecile uh, Wallonnet and, mm -hmm. and all of, of Ely's ancestors, going back to Greylock and all the rest, and mm -hmm. many, many others. There are many others mm -hmm. for which we are so grateful uh, mm -hmm. that they hung in here when we were uh, yes. not listening. Right. Hopefully, mm -hmm. we will all be listening better in the coming generations. Thank you for taking the time to come over here today so we could record these programs uh, at CATV8. Uh, Thank and you, we Jim. began in the first program. Uh, I'm not knowing that if somebody watching now saw the first program or not. I hope you did. If not, it'll be available on the CATV website. Uh, but at the beginning of the program, Jesse, you talked about when, particularly on rivers, welcoming how people would, would meet and welcome with a song. Can mm -hmm. you think of a song that we might finish with? Um, yeah, I, I think it's fun to a, a term um, that is said, which is if you don't want somebody to leave, you could say in the language, and I'll just give you the English, your paddle is hidden, which is the translation is wonderful. Your paddle is hidden. But eventually people do find their paddle and they have to make <laughs> their way and, and go. So I think we'll find ours. And as we go, instead of saying uh, the simple goodbye, there's a song that says um, travel well. Take good care of yourselves until I see you again. Travel well, take good care of yourself or yourselves until we see you again or oh, until I, I see you that again. One. Yeah, <laughs> I think that'd be a good one, and it's a, a, a more <coughs> traditional way of, of greeting someone uh, adieu. And it says, Uli Pam Kani, Uli Nana Walmazi, Kinana Yozi Mina. Uli pam kani, uli nana walmazi, kinami ozi mina. Uli pam kani, uli nana walmazi, kinami ozi mina. Uli pam kani, uli nana walmazi, kinami ozi mina. Uli pam kani, uli nana walmazi, kinami ozi mina. Uli pam kani, uli nana walmazi, kinami ozi mina. It's kind of like a sad song, really. It is. It's like we're parting. Yeah. Thank you, Terry. Thank you for being here. I'm Terry Boone for CATVA. Thank you.